Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Ripley's Aquarium of Canada Conservation Conversation Series. My name's Katie. I'm the Manager of Education and Conservation here at the Aquarium. Uh, and this series is all chatting with people who have similar conservation environmental interests to us at the Aquarium on a variety of topics. So if this is the first one you're watching, make sure you check out uh, our YouTube channel for previous conservation conversations. And of course, we'll continue to bring you more in the coming months. So today we have a special guest joining us. Uh, my guest is going to be Emily D'Souza. She uh, has lots of sustainable seafood related content to share with us. But just to give you a little background on Emily, her family emigrated to Canada from the Azores Islands where small scale fisheries are critical to food security, economic livelihoods and cultural traditions. Growing up in a Portuguese household, Emily was surrounded by seafood her entire life and is, continues to be surrounded by seafood. Uh, it's part of her personal and family identity. It's what they have at their family gatherings. It's the food she gravitates towards at restaurants and it has informed where she's traveled. Uh, Emily's academic career steered her towards marine social science and environmental governance. She has become increasingly more aware and more interested in how the oceans could sustainably feed the world and continue to support economies and cultures of coastal communities like the one where her family comes from. So thank you so much, Emily, for joining us. We're so excited to have you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your area of specialization? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here and to have the opportunity to chat about sustainable seafood. I'm a huge fan of the aquarium. So this is uh, just a really cool opportunity for me. I'm so grateful. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I, um, I'm a fishery scientist and I also run my own business. So I actually just completed my master's degree at the University of Guelph. Um, my research was focusing on primarily small scale fisheries in North America and also looking at how the pandemic impacted seafood supply chains around the world. Um, so really interesting stuff. I really loved it. And I was fortunate enough to be able to take that academic uh, background and that research and apply it to my own business. Um, so I run my own business right now that primarily focuses on um, different aspects of research consulting and digital marketing. So I work with a lot of different clients in the seafood industry, including NGOs, um, different seafood companies, and even international bodies like the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. So I'm actually um, right now a market specialist in fisheries and aquaculture for the FAO, working on a few different research projects related to small scale fisheries and global trade. And then on my own platforms, I run a platform called Seaside with Emily. That's an online blog and also my social media channels. And basically on Seaside with Emily, what I do is I try to disseminate a lot of this fishery science and very technical and complicated um, ideas related to sustainable seafood um, and break it down into ways that are easier to understand for the average consumer. Um, I share sustainable, sustainable seafood guidance and tips um, and recipes. Um, not a professional chef but I share the recipes anyway. Um, and I'm really just trying to make sustainable seafood more, um, more approachable for the average person. Awesome, so let's start with that. So for anyone who might be watching that's not familiar with this term sustainable seafood, can you break it down for us? What's that all about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in its simplest sense, sustainable seafood, it refers to seafood that's been caught or farmed in a sustainable way. So when we think about wild caught seafood, essentially harvesting wild fish at a rate that is allowing the population to replenish so they don't drop below a certain stock level. So we have an entire field of science dedicated to this, to you know, knowing what the optimal stock level is and what the optimal catch levels are for every single species. Um, and basically the goal is that every single year we only catch the allotted amount and we ensure that that species is able to replenish. It also involves things like thinking about different gear types. So using gear that minimizes bycatch, so accidentally catching non-target species. So when we talk about bycatch, a lot of people think about things like dolphins and turtles. So using gear that minimizes the impact on those non-target species, you know, so we're not catching turtles accidentally or dolphins when we are fishing for other species. And also thinking about the impact on the marine ecosystem itself um, and habitats for other animals. So, you know, more destructive fishing gear types like trawling, not the most sustainable because they do have a pretty significant impact on the ocean floor. And so that may, again, that might not be the most sustainable gear type. So we want to try to gravitate towards more sustainable gear types that, you know, aren't ripping up the ocean floor and aren't having this destructive effect on, um, on marine habitats. When we think about 
um, farmed fish because I think um, there is a, a lot of sort of misconceptions specifically around farm fish. Farm fish can also be very sustainable. Um, and when we think about what a sustainable farm fish looks like, um, some of the things to look for include what we call the fish in fish out ratio. So the fish in fish out ratio should be one or lower. And essentially what that means is that it only takes one wild fish to to produce one farmed fish. If we have to catch three or four wild fish to use as feed for one farm fish, that's not necessarily sustainable. Um, but you know, if we can produce two or three farm fish with only one wild fish, that's more sustainable. And then um, also with farm fish, thinking about things like um, avoiding fish escapes and the impact on wild populations and trying to minimize disease spread and waste discharge into the marine ecosystem. Something that's really interesting to me is sort of the evolution of land-based aquaculture too. Like I know uh, here in Ontario, there's a couple of, I think, two different shrimp operations that are now mm -hmm. farming shrimp nowhere near the ocean and doing it uh, in a really interesting, and I know the demand for it from restaurants and stuff has been really high too, because people are really interested in this concept of locally produced farmed shrimp. So uh, mm -hmm. lots of cool science going on there too. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of really cool and sustainable aquaculture production, specifically in the province of Ontario. So like you said, shrimp, Planet Shrimp is a, is a company that I've done a little bit of work with and they, um, they farm shrimp very sustainably here in Ontario. Um, and in Ontario, actually, our, our main aquaculture species is trout. So we farm a lot of um, trout here in Ontario, which is a really delicious fish that, like you said, like people love to support local now more than ever. And so trout is a really great option here in Ontario. I 100% agree. I try and I, there's through the summer months, I have a local place that I get trout from almost on a weekly basis. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how did you get started on this sustainable seafood fisheries journey? I talked a little bit in the intro about sort of your, your family background, but uh, that's, this is, you got some real technical knowledge here and uh, a really interesting sort of path, I think, on how you got there. Yeah, so I think my um, my family roots definitely, I, I say, have a large part in it um, and kind of even, um, you know, when I didn't know, I, when I didn't know at first, that's what was driving me. I realized now that's definitely what was driving me. Um, so yeah, seafood has just always been part of my identity. It's what I eat all the time. It's what, you know, we would serve at family holidays. It was always just a, a no brainer that there was seafood there. And when I went to university, um, I did my undergrad at the University of Guelph as well in environmental governance. And so I was sort of broadly interested in sustainability and conservation. Um, and environmental policy. But I always just had this pull to the ocean. Again, I think largely because my family comes from islands. Um, and so I was, you know, I became a, a paddy dive master. So doing a lot of scuba diving and free diving, and really just passionate about ocean conservation. And so I was learning, I was applying a lot of what I was learning in my undergrad to ocean issues and marine issues, and doing a lot of volunteering with different NGOs related um, within the marine conservation space. Um, and I noticed that there seemed to be a very common discourse that sort of um, eating seafood or fishing, it just, it couldn't be done sustainably. And that if you wanted to be involved in marine conservation, you know, you had to stop eating fish or, you know, there was not really, there wasn't really a lot of conversations happening about sustainable fishing or sustainable seafood in the conservation space. Um, it was just sort of a, that doesn't exist. It's not sustainable. We're not going to bother talking about it. Um, and I found that really disappointing and I didn't really believe it to be true. Um, you know, like I said, seafood has just always been such a huge part of my family's culture, of our identity, of food security on the islands where we come from, of economic livelihoods on the islands that we come from. And the fishermen that I had met in my life, you know, they're the greatest stewards of the ocean. Um, every single fisherman that I've met has been a very passionate, arguably one of the most passionate ocean conservationists ever. And so I knew that there was definitely ways to fish and eat seafood sustainably. Um, and I sort of set out on a quest to figure out what that was. And that's sort of what inspired my journey to graduate school, where I was exploring sustainable seafood and the contributions of fisheries to global food security and trying to figure out, you know, how fish could feed the world. Um, and then that path is just sort of, I guess, continued on and, and led me here. And I'm, I think I'm, I'm really happy to say that I think the conversation has evolved a lot more from when I, you know, when I started doing this work six or seven years ago, when those conversations were really being shut down before, you know, they were even opened up and even had the opportunity to discuss 
anything related to sustainable fishing within the conservation space. I think that dialogue has changed a lot now. And I think now more than ever, people are open to the idea of talking about you know, blue foods and the contributions of seafood to global food security. You know, this idea of how we're going to feed a growing population has become, I think, more imminent than ever. And again, I think that people are starting to recognize fish more, the contributions of fish and seafood more and more in those conversations today. And so I'm really happy to see that that dialogue has evolved since I first got into this space. It's, it's something that comes up quite a bit at the aquarium too, is that we people expect that we will say that you shouldn't eat seafood at all. Um, and we're on the same page as you. Seafood is a huge part of global economic uh, sustainability for so many people and such as, as valuable protein source for a huge mm -hmm. portion of the world's population. It's not feasible to tell people just stop eating seafood. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, I think we're all in agreement, like seafood is a great thing to eat, but you need to make choices to make sure that 20, 50, 100 years down the road that it's still an option. Because uh, mm -hmm. if we don't pay attention to how we're catching seafood, we're definitely getting ourselves uh, into a, a bad position. So um, can you give us a little rundown sort of on where we are fish stock wise, like if we don't look at sustainable seafood and make these choices, what sort of are the implications down the road? Yeah, definitely. I think another real positive that I've experienced since I've started working in this space is that fish stock levels are improving and they are continuously improving seemingly year after year. The Food and Agriculture Organization, they release a report every single year, actually. It's called the SOFIA Report, the State of the World's Fisheries and Aquaculture. Um, and the report that came out in 2020 showed that over 70% of the seafood that we eat today comes from sustainably managed fish stocks, uh, which is an increase from previous years. And of course, it's not perfect. There's definitely still room for improvement. And I think that's why myself and a lot of other scientists, you know, work in this space to figure out how we can get that number to 100%. That's definitely the end goal. Um, and I think, you know, managing fish stocks and in harvesting seafood in a sustainable way is so important for so many different reasons. And I think at its very core, the main reason is that fish is a food source. Um, I think a lot of people forget this. And I think a lot of that is just because of the ways that we speak about seafood, the way that we address seafood in in policy, in policy and regulation. Um, even the term seafood itself, I sometimes think is a little bit problematic. I mean, we don't say land food, you know, we don't like the seafood is really referring to a, a quite diverse um, set of different types of foods and, and plants and organisms that we can eat. And so um, it just seems almost silly that we even call it seafood. And I think the fact that we call it seafood is one of the contributors to this disconnect of fish being food um, and treating fish as food and policy more often than not. Um, when, we, when, Like I said, when we've had these conversations about how to address global food security, how to feed a growing population, those conversations tend to revolve around agriculture and land-based food systems. And they really tend to ignore the contributions of fish and seafood. And so I think, you know, fundamentally, Fish is food, um, and if we fail to manage fisheries sustainably, it could have some really detrimental impacts on global food security. I mean, if we think about, for example, the Global South, um, the Global South is, you know, one of the largest areas in which seafood contributes to food security um, and also to nourishment. Um, so seafood is a really great source of a lot of different um, nutrients and vitamins, a lot of micronutrients that aren't available in other animal based proteins. And so for a lot of people in the Global South who fish in small scale fisheries, Seafood is their main source of protein and their main source of nourishment. And if they were to lose seafood as, as their protein source, you know, as a result of a fisheries collapse or overexploitation, we would see a serious rise in hunger and malnourishment in those parts of the world. If we think about, you know, here in Canada and the global north, if we were to lose access to seafood, of course, here we don't necessarily eat um, for the most part, we don't necessarily eat on average as much seafood as other parts of the world. Um, but seafood is still a, a really critical piece of our diets here in the global north. And if we were to lose access to seafood because we haven't managed them sustainably, and again, you know, we have fisheries collapse, what we could see is we could see a lot of people turn to things like red meat as their main source of protein in their diet. Um, and of course, we know now that red meat has some pretty negative effects, both environmental and human health wise, um, whereas seafood tends to be a lower impact protein. It doesn't have, you know, 
creates far fewer emissions than things like chicken or beef. Um, and the health impacts of seafood are far more positive than something like red meat. And again, being that critical source um, of nourishment for people all around the world. I think I think just thinking about fish as food is one of the, the core components of what drives myself as a fishery scientist and other fishery scientists to make sure that we do manage these sustainably, because at the end of the day, this is a food source that we need to maintain for the future. Excellent. Cool. Um, so where would you say the science fits into all of this? Are we doing enough science? What science are we lacking? What data do we need to help us make uh, better decisions or to manage fish stocks better going forward? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of great people working in the space. There's a ton of people working in the space. I mean, we have an entire branch of science, uh, fishery science, just dedicated to exploring sustainable seafood and to, to try to figure out the best ways to sustainably manage fisheries. Um, and so this field of fishery science that I'm that I work within is really dedicated to that exact question. How can we manage fisheries? How can we manage this food source in a way that allows us to feed a growing population, that allows us to continue to support coastal, coastal livelihoods and economies and coastal cultures, while also minimizing our impact on the marine ecosystem. And I think what's really cool about fishery science also, and one of the reasons that I love working in this field is that it's so interdisciplinary. Um, and so across fishery science, you get to work with a lot of different people, including, you know, marine biologists, economists, political scientists, um, people who work in, in land-based food systems. Um, and all these people sort of come together to create this field of fishery science. And I think the field itself has definitely also been improving over the years, the same way, you know, Fish, fish stock levels have been improving. I think fishery science has been improving. Technology has been improving. I think we're seeing more people enter the space. I think that we're seeing a lot more um, a lot more advances in technology that helps with monitoring at sea, which I think is a huge piece of fishery science. Obviously, we need that data. We need to know what's going on, um, how many fish are being caught. You know, We need to be able to see what's happening on fishing vessels. And I think those types of monitoring have been improving quite a lot in recent years. Um, and like I said, the increase in just interdisciplinary collaborations that we're seeing come about in, in the space have been really, really, um, really positive. And I think are part of what's driving, like I said, that sort of evolution of the dialogue where more and more people are talking about blue foods and talking about seafood as a way to address, you know, global food security. And I think a lot of it is because of that collaboration. Um, and I know we're going to talk about it in a little bit, but things like the blue food assessment where we saw fishery scientists, you know, uh, people who work in, again, sustainable food systems, economists, political scientists, geographers, all these different people in different fields of study come together just to address the idea of sustainable seafood and sustainable fisheries. I think is really telling of, you know, where the field is and where it's headed in the future. Awesome. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that now. So mm -hmm. this term blue foods was a newer one to me, that's for sure. So can you sort of unpack that for us a bit? What's, what's the, what is blue food? What's the blue food assessment? And, and what does that, what kind of information does it provide for us as consumers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the blue food assessment is a really incredible project. Um, one that I'm not personally involved with, but have loved watching it progress. It is, I think, I just get so, I just want to geek out about it because I think it's one of the coolest things that have happened in fishery science. Again, because we see that big collaboration, the Blue Food Assessment is essentially a series of papers um, that are being rolled out um, over time. And th these papers are being written by 100 scientists across the world at over 25 different institutions. So again, like that sense of collaboration is really telling when you have people from all across the world collaborating on this one single issue of sustainable seafood and blue food for food security. And essentially, when I say blue food, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about food that comes from the oceans and, and lakes and rivers and aquaculture. And um, so far, the Blue Food Assessment has released five papers, and those five papers address things like the nutritional contributions of seafood. So like I was talking about earlier, how seafood is a really great source of a lot of rare micro micronutrients that aren't available in other animal proteins. These papers actually look at the nutritional um, the nutritional contributions of seafood against other types of protein. Um, some of the papers also look at things like aquaculture and the contributions of aquaculture to feed a growing population um, and how can we feed a growing population. They also look at 
demand for seafood, which is actually only expected to increase. Um, the papers actually estimate that by the year 2050, seafood consumption and demand will have doubled from where it is today. Um, and so these papers are really looking at how do we meet demand in a sustainable way? Again, how do we how do we continue to preserve the marine ecosystem, support coastal communities, and also deal with things like climate change that are you know rapidly changing they're shifting fish stocks, they're changing the, the ocean landscape, they're changing the way fish move, the way that, we, that we're that we able to fish, they're changing the duration of fishing seasons. And so the blue food assessment is really, you know, looking at things like nutritional contributions of seafood, environmental impacts of seafood against, again, like other, other animal proteins, and then also looking at how can we manage them in the face of such change due to factors like climate change. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Um, so You've shared lots of great resources today, and I know we had your website up earlier, but um, where anywhere else you think we could go to find more information or just go to your website and d dive in there and sort of see where it takes us? Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I, I've got to plug my website and my social media. I'm at Seaside with Emily um, everywhere online. I think there are also a lot of like great NGOs to follow who do a lot of work in sustainable seafood. I know you mentioned OceanWise. We were chatting before we, we started about OceanWise and uh, the great work that they do in sustainable seafood. And I'm fortunate enough to work with OceanWise quite a bit. And um, they're another great source for information. Um, also other NGOs like the Marine Stewardship Council. It's another great source of information. Um, yeah, I think sort of there's a lot more like i'm saying how the dialogue is opening up about sustainable seafood and food uh fish being food i think we're also seeing a lot more of that enter into the social media world and so i think you know even on places like tiktok i know a lot of influencers now who do um you know marine conservation tiktok and talk about sustainable seafood and so there are so many resources out there and i yeah of course always post on my page to try to make this information accessible so at seaside with emily um on all social media Awesome. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed browsing through your website. And yeah, mm -hmm. OceanWise has been a great partner for us. They're great, whether you're looking for a restaurant that serves sustainable seafood, or if you're looking to know sort of what to buy at the grocery store, they've got sort of both available on their site, which is fantastic. And I know you have lots of resources similar to that on your website as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So what should I make for dinner tonight? What's your <laughs> go to Emily recommends seafood or recipe that uh, I should put on my uh, to-do list for, for coming up soon. Yeah, well, I mean, the weather is getting colder. And so for me, in the colder months, I love making like heartier seafood dishes. So I'm in a little bit of a cycle right now between like seafood chowder and seafood pasta because um, mm -hmm. they're both relatively easy to make. And I mean, you can make it your own. You can throw your favorite kind of seafood in a seafood chowder and make it different every single time. So those have been my go-tos over the past couple of weeks as it's been getting chillier here in Ontario. Yeah, I love a good seafood chowder. I've not made one on my own, so I might have to to venture into the world of making my own seafood chowder, that's for sure. Well, Definitely. thank you so much, Emily. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you today. Um, so much great information and great to see. We love women in science and plug for University of Guelph. My undergrad is mm -hmm. from there too. So I like to support uh, other alumni. Um, and yeah, really excited to, to check out what's coming up on your social media pages and stuff to learn more about sustainable seafood. I agree, this is such an important topic and it's great that people are talking about it more and more and it's becoming sort of top of mind for people. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, thank you so much for your time. It was great chatting. Yeah, thanks again for having me. This is awesome. Great. So everyone, did, uh, keep tuned for our YouTube channel for upcoming conservation conversations. We'll continue to bring them to you through the fall months as uh, on a variety of topics, including sustainable seafood and lots of other things as well. Uh, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you again soon.